why, wondering why I'm wearing an elf Christmas hat. It's because I went to the Pathfinder Christmas party tonight and I won this hat in the uh, gift exchange game. Yeah, it was totally fun. And so now I am elf. This is not all I won. You are going to love what I won. Besides this hat at the Pathfinder Christmas party, I won this hat. And inside, there was like a bunch of presents. So like the hat was the thing that had the presents inside. And it's literally an elf hat from like, you know, the elf Christmas movie, which is totally hilarious. You know, I'm singing and it's Christmas. Okay. Anyway. So this is why the live is so late tonight. It is very late at night, but I'm doing the live late because I was at the Christmas party and I won, like, so we had a gift exchange that the gift could not be worth more than $10. I won this hat and inside was a bunch of cool stuff, including, look at this. It's a monkey. It's a boxing monkey, yeah, with candy inside. <laughs> okay, have you guys figured it out by now? I am I'm a big child. Okay. Besides being totally a Jesus freak, I'm also a child. So this monkey was inside the hat. Okay, and you know I love to collect cups. Like, I have all the been there cups from all over the world. Montana, Idaho, Portland, Georgia, Miami, Florida, New York, Ohio, New York City, California, Disneyland, San Diego, you name it. I collect cups. I love cups. Today, inside this elf hat that I got at the Pathfinder Christmas party, along with my punchy monkey candy thing. Look, there's candy inside and the monkey punches. Haha. <laughs> Come on, guys. It's funny. You know it's funny. And he's missing some teeth, too. All right. Punchy monkey. Okay, but here's el what else I got. I love cups. I collect cups. This one is from The Office. This is on my desk. World's best boss. Okay, my office secretary bought this for me, but when I tried to, like, tell people that she bought it for me, I was like, hey, look at this cup that my office manager bought for me. And she said, what cup? To make it look like I bought it for myself, to proclaim myself as the world's best boss. Okay, she's really actually the boss. I'm not even the boss. Right. Anyway, who cares? Who cares who the boss is? I'm not the boss. All right. Anyway, also, okay, I got this mug. Now, all of the kids love to play Minecraft. This is a Minecraft video game cup that came inside the hat. And guess what? This is so cool. When you, when you pour um, hot water inside, it goes from being black and green to being green and white. It changes color. Okay, guys, I know this doesn't matter at all to you, but I collect cups. I love cups. And, okay... I actually like the movie Elf. It's funny. It's like the funniest Christmas movie ever. Totally wholesome. And, you know, he sings terribly, drinks syrup and eats candy and everything else, and falls in love with a beautiful girl. It's a cute story, okay? All right. Forget the hat. I'm going to put it over here on my um, Joseph hat. You guys want to see my Joseph hat? Well, it's actually... My Israelite storyteller hat. <laughs> okay. What you guys don't know is I'm just a big kid. It's why, well, yeah, I'm still a child. I haven't grown up yet. Should I do Bible in a year wearing this? This is actually kind of cool. I sort of like it, you know? Yeah, I got this when I was Joseph, and then I also played Baruch the Israelite storyteller wearing this hat. So anyway, the reason why this hat is out is because I won a, a Christmas prize at the Pathfinder Christmas party. It's Elf. The Elf Christmas hat. For those of you that are just coming on the live and missed it. And then I had to show you my Israelite Storyteller hat. And I actually still have the Israelite Storyteller robe. I actually wore this. 
and dedicated a baby on Christmas and told the story about Jesus' baby dedication. Okay. So anyway, I'm super excited because I won, you know, we did a gift exchange where you have to play the game and you roll the dice and there's all these different things like 1 through 12 that you have to do. And I ended up with the elf hat that has had a bunch of presents in it. And I even had one of my church members give me several Seattle Mariner rookie cards from last year's team. The very first team to make the playoff in years. I had a great night. But this is why the Bible in a Year Instagram Live is, is happening so late. is because I've been out there with the Pathfinders having fun. And I love my punching monkey. <laughs> I'm like, let, I'll never eat the candy. But I... <laughs> come on, guy. <laughs> you got... All right. I'm sorry. I'm a see. This is why. This is why I'm a like. This is why I do so good with young people, and it's why I'm going to Australia as an evangelist for the youth, right? Because as I was showing everybody at the Pathfinder Christmas party, okay. After the live, I'm gonna make. I want to make. Uh, I'm gonna make a reel. I'm gonna sing the Christmas song. Um, you're gonna love it. I'm going to post it afterwards. It's late at night. Watch it tomorrow. Whatever. I know. I shouldn't even be doing the Instagram live. But, all joking aside, yoink. All right. All, all of the silliness aside, we are on the Bible in a Year Instagram live for December 23 and 24. I know we're working ahead. I'm doing two days worth of readings a day all the way through to finish everything up except for the final day. Oh, you have one of those hats too? Yeah, okay, I love it. I love the elf hat. I'm going to do the December 31st reading, as you guys know, in Australia on January 1st, except for in the United States, it'll be 515 on the 31st. So mark your calendars. If you want to be a part of the final Instagram Live for the Bible in a Year reading challenge, if you want to be live for that and celebrate with me, finishing the whole thing, I even got a brand new Samsung Galaxy Ultra 22, which should be here tomorrow or Thursday. I'm going to get my phone switched over before I go to Australia, and you guys are going to get to see me do my very first live on a brand new phone. I've had this phone that I'm on right now since like 2016 or 17. So 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. I've had this phone for like six years. <laughs> And it's literally falling apart. The screen is cracked. I don't even know how I'm able to still do the lives. I have to clean the lens every day just so you can see me. It's terrible. And the phone is totally full. God blessed me and helped me to get a brand new phone. I'm so excited for the videos I'm going to take in Australia. So you guys have a promise for me. I'm getting a brand new phone that has the most amazing camera that any cell phone has on it. It's the Samsung Galaxy Ultra 22. And I know many of you are like, why aren't you getting why aren't you getting an iPhone, right? No, guys, I'm telling you, I know this for a fact. I used to work for Walmart in the electronics department. I really do know a lot about cell so phones. I also worked for Verizon. Um, the Galaxy Ultra 22 has like the most amazing video and also um, picture camera on it. And it also has the most amazing selfie camera on it, which is what I use for the lives, right? So... Um, literally the best camera on any phone in the entire market. God blessed me. And I won't say who, but literally somebody basically bought me the phone. Yes. I bought the phone, but a group of an, of amazing, generous people were like, Pastor Farr, we're going to pay for your phone for you. So they're literally paying for my brand new Samsung Galaxy Ultra 22 so that I have a better phone for doing the Bible in a year and for doing evangelism. Praise the Lord from whom all blessings flow. What an answer to prayer. And with all of the medical bills that are rolling in right now, I just know that God did that for me, okay? God is watching out for me. He is so good. It's so amazing. Okay. Anyway. 
Yeah, I love Samsung Galaxy. I, I don't even know how to use iPhone. I've tried. I no. I know for people who are iPhone people that they're just going to be like, dude, it's so easy. You can just learn it in two days. Okay, fine. But the thing is, is I've been using Android since the beginning of time because when I was in school, all of the theology majors basically worshipped at the altar of Steve Jobs. Like they were like, if you don't have an iPhone, you won't go to heaven. Like, they literally had a theology of iPhone. And so, like, I have literally, I refuse to give in to the paying exorbitant amounts of money for iPhone and for Mac. Like, I won't. I just won't. Even if people can, like, prove to me that it's the most superior product on planet Earth, I, which I don't even really think because it's, I've tried to use it, and it's just counterintuitive to me. For some reason, I think there's, like, two types of brains. Some people for some reason, feel like using iPhone and Mac products is the most easy thing on planet Earth. For some reason, I've always been a PC Android person, and it just seems very, like, naturally intuitive to me to use it. So, anyway, I just think, buy the thing that, um, get the thing that makes common sense to you. Like, a tool should never be hard to use. You buy the tool to make whatever you need to do easier, right? So for me, I don't care if you're an iPhone person, I don't care if you're an Android person. Whatever is easiest for you to use and makes you happy, that's what you should do. That, To me, that makes sense. But anyway, all right, let's pray. I'm going to do Proverbs and Psalms first, and then I'm going to say very little about Revelation and Zechariah today. This is the Bible in a Year reading challenge, 357 and 358. Um, so this is Bible in a Year. 357, 358. Boom. Let's pray. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for helping me to complete the Bible in a Year Reading Challenge, even though this week has been super crazy with doctor's appointments and getting ready to go to Australia and, yeah, just doing all of the final wrapping up the end of year, getting ready for Christmas, getting ready to preach this weekend, and getting on a plane on the 26th and traveling to Australia. So much going on, so much to do. Yet you're still helping me get two days worth of readings done every day so that I can finish the Bible in a year reading challenge before the end of the year. And I want to praise you for giving me the strength and the perseverance and helping me to just remain steadfast in daily praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and doing the Bible in a year reading challenge without fail and getting to the finish line. And Lord, for all of the people who have not finished yet, I just pray that they will do one day at a time until they finish, that they will not give up, that they will keep reading, that they will keep praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit every day until they finish all 365 readings and finish reading the entire Bible. Help us to just keep persevering, God, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I know it's super late at night, so if you can't stay up for this live and you just got to go to bed, I'm not going to be insulted. I love all of you. Let's see, who do we have here? We got Lynn Rydell, we got Marco, we got Sarah. Some of you are on the other side of the world, so it's daytime for you. We got Brian, Deb, um, Ketley, Mario, and Lisa. Thank you for being here with me, even though it's late at night, and for not judging me for being up at 1038 at night. You guys know I work around the clock. It's crazy. But, you know, hey, I got to spend the evening with the young people, and I think I can get a thumbs up from all of you that prioritizing my time to be with the Pathfinders tonight for their Christmas party is like the place I should have been. Instead of like locking myself in my office and doing my Bible readings earlier and doing the live earlier, like I should literally be with the young people at the Christmas party, spending time with them, having fun with them, enjoying life. That's where life has to be, friends. You got to be out there. You can't like, we don't, we shouldn't live our lives on the phones. We got to be with people. We got to be making, we got to be loving people. That's what I do, okay? My whole life, those are my kids. I love them. So, hallelujah. Okay, I'm going to do the Proverbs first, then the Psalms, and then I'm going to make a few comments on Zechariah and Revelation. And then I'm getting out of here because I want to make a video of me singing. Like, I want to do an uh, Instagram reel of me singing the uh, chestnuts roasting on an open fire Christmas song because I'm in the Christmas spirit. Yeah, I've been sending out Christmas cards to everyone in my family having a fun time spoiling them and sending them all out for family dinners and things and movie passes and, you know, everything you can think of. I'm in, I'm just, yeah. Ketley says they keep you young. Yes. 
and it's keeping me super young. Even though I'm going through like health challenges, I'm still happy and I'm having like the best day I've had in a long time. I do have bags under my eyes. I'm tired. Please do not tell me I look old. Tell me I look young. I need to <laughs> lie to me. Lie to me. No, don't really lie to me. It's fine. It's fine. I'm getting older, but I'm aging gracefully and staying young. So who cares? I, I'm just loving it. All right. Proverbs 21 to 23. Here we go. These are really interesting texts, friends. I would love to hear what you think of them. If you did the reading today, I want to hear what you think. Under three things the earth trembles. Proverbs 30, 21. Here we go. Under three things the earth trembles. Under four it cannot bear up. A slave when he becomes king. And a fool when he is filled with food. An unloved woman when she gets a husband. Hmm. Under three things, the earth trembles. Under four, it cannot bear up. And then the final thing is, and a maid servant when she displaces her mistress. Hmm. Okay. Uh, verse 24. Four things on earth are small, but they are exceedingly wise. Mm hmm. The ants are a people not strong, yet they provide their food in the summer. 26. The rock badgers are a people not mighty, yet they make their homes in the cliffs. The locusts have no king, yet they all of them march in rank. The lizard you can take in your hands, yet it is in king's palaces. Hmm. Yeah, maybe that's trying to tell us that what we may think is weak, we can actually learn something from the way they do things. Like the ants storing up the food in the summer so that in the winter they don't have to go out and freeze, right? I mean, what's the lifespan of an ant, right? But they're smart. Okay, Psalms. Psalm 142. I mean, essentially, it seems like at the end of Psalms, like the last eight Psalms, he's like crying out to God like every day, right? Psalm 142. With my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my troubles before him. Uh, verse 5. Well, actually, you know, I'm just going to keep reading the whole thing. Verse 3. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see. There is none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison, that I may give thanks to your name. And I think about when, I, when he says, bring me out of prison, I think about him like freeing us from slavery to sin, right? The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. My soul thirsts for you. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. This is Psalm 143. In your faithfulness, answer me in your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. For the enemy has pursued my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me sit in darkness like those long dead. Ah, oh, I feel this. Trust me. Most of you see me as this happy, goofy guy that's, you know, just having the most wonderful life ever. But there are definitely moments of my life that are super dark, super lonely, super sad. It is not easy standing on the word of God in this world. It is not easy following the calling to pick up your cross and follow Jesus. Because what he does is he asks you to lay aside all of your selfishness and devote your life and your time to others. Right? And so that means you have to be willing to sacrifice selfishness on a daily basis. So for the enemy has pursued my soul, he has crushed my life to the ground, he has made me sit in darkness like those long dead. I definitely feel this. Therefore my spirit faints within me, my heart within me is of hold. Ugh, I have, like, I, I, I relate to this so much. I love David, he's like the greatest psalm. He's like, the psalms, I just relate so much to a lot of his lamenting, right? I remember the days of old, he says, I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Selah. 
He's like, God, I'm begging for mercy. And I can remember the times of old that were better than now. And I know you can restore me. I literally went to the doctor today and I was telling the doctor my goals. And the doctor looked at me and said, Stephen, you know what we're going to do? We're going to try to help you to achieve your goals, but we're going to help you achieve even more than that. And I loved that. It gave me hope. I told him this was my goal. I want to repair my hips, my lower back, and my neck so that I can get out there and I'm full of energy. My mind is sharp. I may be 41, but I feel like I'm like 30. If I didn't have the back and the hip problems, like I would literally feel, you know, and obviously I I have those, I have the back and the hip problems from running marathons. I'll just show you guys. (laughs) I was an athlete who raised money for a lot of different charities like cancer, Alzheimer's, education. So here we go. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And here's all of my running medals. So yeah, all the way through my 30s, I was an athlete running marathons. And well, wear and tear on the back and the hips. And now I'm, you know, needing to go through the process of going to get the healing that I need. And I'm going to be going through physical therapy, strengthening myself. I'm not giving up on life because I want to take the gospel of the kingdom into all the world as a witness to all the nations. And so, and I also, I love, I don't know about you guys, how many of you can raise your hands to saying, I love going out in God's nature and hiking. I love being out in nature. There are so many places all over planet Earth I want to go see just to see the beauty of God's creation. So, I I have to rehab. I may have to do some surgeries, but I'm going to do what it takes because I'm not done yet. I want to keep living. I want to keep sharing the word of God. I want to keep I'm going to keep going. I'm I'm a fighter. I'm not I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. So I'm I'm crying out to God and I'm going to say it right now. I'm going to say it to all of you. The best part of my life is still in front of me. I believe it. I'm stretching out my hands to you, O God, for my soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Answer me quickly, O Lord. Verse 7. My spirit fails. Hide not your face from me, lest I be like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Make me know that I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Deliver me from my enemies, O Lord. I have fled to you for refuge. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life in your righteousness. Bring my soul out of trouble. Oh, I love it. In God's righteousness, he's going to bring me out of trouble, right? And in your steadfast love, you will cut off my enemies. And you will destroy all the adversaries of my soul, for I am your servant. Hey, God has got us. And even if our health fails, he's still preserving our soul. Remember what it says. Do not fear the one who can destroy the flesh or destroy the body, but instead fear him who has the power over hellfire. Okay, so how many of you felt like the readings in Zechariah and and Revelation were just really interesting today, right? I'm going to get my Andrew Study Bible, and we're going to get some help figuring out what in the world these chapters were talking about. I don't know about you guys, but I love these icebreaker mints. I know they say that these are terrible for you and you shouldn't eat them, but they're minty. They taste like the 23 degree weather that's going on in Pendleton right now. (laughs) Okay. Let's go to Zechariah. How many of you did the Zechariah readings today? Zechariah 4 through 7. Okay. I just want to look at like the overview of what Zechariah is all about, right? Here we go. Contents and theme. So the book of Zechariah has a rich variety of themes and covers a broad array of topics, making it very challenging to summarize this book. Mm-hmm. Because when I was reading 
chapters four, five, six, and seven, it was like, what are we talking, well, what? It just seemed like it was going everywhere, right? So the prophet clearly proclaims that Judah's sinful past led to divine punishment. And that was Zechariah 1, 4 through 6, 7, 11 through 14. The exile is not presented as a coincidence, but as a judgment due to the unfaithfulness of the covenant people. However, the Lord has not forgotten his people. And this is the one thing I love about this book, right? In fact, he plans to act on their behalf, meting out punishment to the foreign nations who destroyed them, and indeed on all the nations who might threaten them in the future. According to Zechariah, a glorious future awaits the leadership and the people of Judah as a whole if they will receive the cleansing from sin and defilement graciously offered by God and respond in faithful obedience, chapter 6, 15. Moreover, this glorious future embraces other nations as well, for foreigners are portrayed as survivors of the coming judgment and worshipers of the true God. Zacharias concept of salvation is a broad, far-reaching vision that embraces the whole world. And that's what's beautiful about what we're looking at in chapters 4, 5, 6, and 7, is we're literally starting to delve into the fact that God is not only judging those who have chosen to be wicked, but he is reclaiming Judah, he is reclaiming Israel, and he is planning on taking the gospel of the kingdom into all the world as a witness to all the nations and saving all of those who have chosen to worship the one true God. And essentially, when you look at Zechariah 4, the vision of the golden lampstand, right? He's basically talking about that there are anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth, right? And that those anointed ones essentially... Like Zerubbabel, the plumb line, ends up being the light to the world. And that through this light to the world, um, that the gospel of the kingdom or the glory of God shines so that even the people in the foreign lands who choose to turn to God are also saved, right? And then in chapter 5, it's got the vision of the flying scroll. Um, I would say that the vision of the flying scroll is probably pointing to the everlasting gospel. Let's see what the Andrews Study Bible says. I'm going back to getting some help. Some of this stuff, just it's so random, it's just really hard to understand it. Am I the only one that sometimes reads stuff in the Bible and I'm like, what is going on? Okay, Zechariah's sixth vision personifies the word of God. Okay, so as I said, word of God, gospel of the kingdom going into all the... So the flying scroll essentially represents the everlasting gospel, right? Um, it emphasizes its inherent power to accomplish its intended purpose and teaches that commandment breakers will be punished for their disobedience. All right. Then, we see in the second half of the chapter the vision of the woman of the basket, right? Sometimes translated as Epha. This basket was common barrel or basket used for measuring, which normally held approximately two-thirds of a bushel. Wickedness is personified as a woman, not for the purpose of denigrating women, but because the Hebrew word for wickedness is a feminine gender noun. Likewise, wisdom also a feminine gender noun. So, both wickedness and wisdom are personified as a woman, and it's not because they're saying that a woman is wicked or a woman is wise. A woman can be wicked or a woman can be wise. That She can be either, just like a man. But basically, it's Wickedness and wisdom is being personified as a wisdom just because in the Greek or in the Hebrew, the word is literally a feminine of the word. So that's just the way the, the Hebrews would translate it, right? Basically, what's happening in this vision is, is wickedness is being taken out of the camp so that God can dwell in the camp. 
Okay. The eighth and final vision is reminiscent of the first one with horses of different colors fulfilling a divine commission. It teaches the sovereignty of God over all powers as evil is defeated and the spirit is proclaimed to be at rest. The spirits of winds, the Hebrew word is the same, are said elsewhere, like Psalms 104 verse 4, to be the messengers of the Lord to fulfill his purpose to the entire earth. The north country denotes Babylon. The south country refers to Egypt. Okay, so essentially, Zechariah chapter 6 is the chapter that's talking about the fact that the horse riders, or the spirits of God, are going into the north and the south to proclaim the gospel even into what would be considered by uh, the Israelites to be heathen nations, right? Then Zechariah chapter 7, literally teaching that obedience is better than fasting or giving offerings or making sacrifices. And then it finishes by showing that disobedience previously resulted in Israel being held captive. Okay, So the captivity of Israel was caused by wickedness and disobedience. In juxtaposition, obedience is better than fasting to God. He would rather have you obey then dress in sackcloth and ashes and fast and beg for mercy because you're continuing in sin. And that's what we covered in Zechariah. Okay. I'm literally aiming at finishing this in the next four minutes. Because we have to be done before 11 o'clock at night. This is way too late for me to be live on Instagram. But, however... We are at the end of the Bible in a Year reading challenge, and I do not want to allow the day to go by without doing the Bible in a Year Instagram Live that I've committed to doing. So I hope you guys appreciate my perseverance, even though it's late. Um, my schedule right now before leaving to Australia is insane, so finding time to do the Bible readings and to do the live is like really difficult. So thank you so much for bearing with me. Those of you that are being patient with me doing the lives late, thank you for being kind and for being gracious. I'm, I'm literally just trying to do my part to fulfill what I've said that I will do because I like to be a man of my word. If I say I'm going to read the Bible in a year, I want to do the Bible in a year. If I say I'm going to try to do the Instagram live every day, I'm going to do it every day. If I say I'm going to do two days worth of readings and do the live, I'm going to try to do it. I do my best to follow through with what I tell you guys I'm going to do. I think it's important to be men and women where our yes is our yes and our no is our no. To try to be faithful to doing what we tell people that we're going to do. So, yeah. I hope that makes sense. I hope you guys can still love me. Even though I have you a late, like literally doing a live at late at night. Okay. Revelation 14. Revelation 14, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and for the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Okay, so first of all, the 144,000 are not necessarily all men and remember once again where you need to understand that revelation is prophetic language so because wickedness would be considered the word wicked is a feminine word a lot of times it's not fair but greek or hebrew translators will translate they will, they will literally um, translate, like basically both the church is a woman, and but also the whore of Babylon is a woman, right? So you have the church, and then you have the whore of Babylon, which in Hebrew thinking would be basically representing the woman who is going after the idols of the world versus the church adorned in Christ's righteousness who is worshiping the one true God. So you have to understand, like, when the Bible talks about, like, oh, you know, those who did not defile themselves with women for they were virgins, well, it could literally be, what that's literally saying is, is that, like, 
These are people, both men and women, who did not defile themselves with the world. Like with the woman of the world or Babylon, right? So, I can tell you right now, the 144,000 are not just men. That, that's not what it's saying. In fact, let me go to my... <laughs> Literally, I'm going to end up going over now. I'm going to go past 11 o'clock just explaining this, but it's worth it. It's worth it to understand, listen, women are not bad and, and men are not, like, good. It's, Bible language is weird and it's hard to understand. That's why we actually have to pray and ask for the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and we have to study. So let's say what they say. See what they say. Okay, they sing a new song, verse 3. New songs arise from new experiences. It requires the experience of salvation, redeemed from the earth, to a heavenly location, either literally after the second coming or spiritually during the final crisis of earth. Virgins. It's a symbol of spiritual purity and loyalty. See, it's not even talking about like being a person who's never been married or had sex. That's not what it's talking about. When it says these are people who are virgins, right, um, that have never defiled themselves with a woman, it's literally saying that they haven't defiled themselves with the woman of the world. It, it's not like, it's, it's not even saying, I hope you guys understand what I'm saying here. It's not saying that the 144,000 that this is being talked about here are only men or only women. It's talking about spiritual purity. It's a symbol of spiritual purity and loyalty to God. They are ready for the wedding of the Lamb. They are first fruits, the first portion of a large crop. Okay, and so also understand, this is very important, the 144,000 is only a first fruit of a much larger crop. Okay, so then you have the three angels' messages, right? Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having an everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. Oh, friends, I get excited about the everlasting gospel. To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. I literally have like these memorized. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Okay, so here it's not, in this, it's not literally talking about, oh, you know, Babylon made people fornicate. So sex is bad. That's not what it's talking about at all. The wine of the wrath of the fornication is literally the worship of the world or idolatry, right? Mixing, like, living your life in sin rather than living your life in faithfulness to God. And then the third angel follows saying, with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of her indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. And, it, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his hand. Okay, this is not saying that people are going to be put into hellfire forever and ever. It's not what that's saying. It's saying that the people who choose the mark of the beast and the image like, are going to literally suffer under the dictatorship of the enemy. Right? And the smoke ascends before God forever and ever, not because the people are literally burning forever and ever, right? But because basically what it means is, is that the torment of these people goes up before God and it's eternal. Like, their punishment is eternal. Their punishment is permanent. Their punishment is final. Their destruction is final. Those who worship the beast and take the mark of the beast in their head and in their hand, which means that they have the law of this world in their mind, and they are doing the work of the enemy, like what they do with their hand, what they think in their mind, it's not a literal mark. It's... Rather than having the law of God written on their heart and their mind, rather than receiving the seal of God and the Holy Spirit, they have chosen the mark of the beast. They have chosen to follow after the beast. So their eyes, their, you know, their mind is focused on the world, and they have now begun to do with their hand what the enemy wants them to do.
And then I love in Revelation 14, we see the reaping of the earth's harvest. We see the reaping of the grapes of, grapes of wrath. So obviously after the first 144,000 are saved, in Revelation 14, 14, 15, and 16, we see that there is still an, there's another harvest of all of the righteous. And then all of the grapes are brought together. The grapes represent the people who were wicked and they receive the wrath of God, right? Okay. And then in Revelation chapter 15, we see the seven last plagues are prepared to fall on the earth. And it's amazing because it says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. Okay, the seven last plagues come after the seven last trumpets. You do understand that, right? So, like, there's the seven trumpets, which many scholars say have already, like, those signs have already been fulfilled. But then there's going to be seven last plagues. But here's the amazing thing. After the seven last plagues are prepared to be poured out on the earth, it says, And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all the nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven were opened, and out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven last plagues of the seven angels were completed. Okay, so why does this happen? The glory of God fills the temple. Nobody can go back in the temple to talk to God. In other words, these seven last plagues, once they begin, God is not going to seek an audience for people to beg for mercy, right? You have the righteous on the sea of glass. You have the wicked who have decided against God. The gospel of the kingdom has gone into all the world as a witness to all the nations. Everybody has had an opportunity to turn to the Lord and to repent. Those who have chosen to be wicked are now going to have the wrath of God poured out on them. The seven last plagues are going to fall on the earth. And the beautiful thing is, is this, the seven last plagues literally do not fall on the righteous. It falls on the wicked. And so the Bible tells us that at the end of time, during the time of trouble that no weapon formed against us will prosper. Okay, this includes the seven last plagues. The seven last plagues do not fall on the righteous. They fall on the wicked. And so, friends, praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life, turning to God and repenting and following the Lord now is, I mean, come on. It's a no-brainer. And, of course, we don't want to just follow the Lord because we don't want to, like, you know, receive the seven last plagues. But what I'm trying to say to you is, is that I love this picture of the righteous standing on the sea of glass waiting for the Lord to return. And they're singing to the Lord about his glory and his righteousness because guys, judgment is good news. Do you realize if the wicked were allowed to go on and on and on and on and on and on and on, that they would continue? Like the longer human beings have been on planet earth, the worse our DNA is. The more, de the more degraded by sin we become, right? And the devil actually knew that if Adam and Eve were to eat from the tree of life after they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that they would live forever being tormented, okay? The devil is the one who wants all of us to live in eternal torment. So the judgment of God is mercy for the righteous and for the wicked, because the judgment of God allows the wicked to be destroyed rather than suffering forever. It gives them what they've asked for. They do not want to be in heaven. They do not want to serve God. They want to be God. Well, they can't be God. And if God separates himself from them, they are going to suffer. If they were, if, if God, basically, if God separates himself from the wicked, they die. Unless God 
purposefully kept them alive in their suffering, which why would a God who is loved do that? Like, okay, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him we might be saved. Okay, God has made it possible for everyone who wants to be in heaven to be there. But if you don't want to be there, he's not going to force you to be there. And also, he's not going to let you be God. Because if anyone, if any human being who's chosen to follow the beast were able to be God, then he would use his power to be selfish and to basically take from everybody else and persecute everybody else, just like Satan does. So clearly, God would not be a just and good and loving God if he allowed the wicked to live forever, okay? Most people are like, oh, no, God's like terrible because he's like this, you know, like you either do what he says or he pours out wrath on you and he's like this evil punisher. No, 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 no. Listen, friends, I'm going to tell you something. You may not agree with me, but this is the truth. And this is the last thing I'm going to say for day 357, 358 of our Bible in the Year uh, reading challenge for the Instagram Live. This is what I'm going to say. The judgment of God is good. This is why the people standing on the sea of glass sing praises to God when the seven last plagues are getting ready to be poured out in full strength upon the earth. It's because the judgment of God is good. It's good whether you're wicked or whether you're righteous. Because the ultimate and final judgment of God on earth is this. He gives eternal life to those who choose to live to live their lives being molded into his image of love. And he destroys those who are wicked, deceived, selfish, and have followed after Satan. And it's mercy. It's mercy. Because if they were allowed to continue going on wanting to be gods rather than wanting to reflect the image of God's love and wanting to be selfish and wanting to do what's good and evil in their own eyes, they would continue to be degraded. They would continue to be more sinful. Human suffering would increase. And for God to keep those people alive eternally, suffering is not love, it's not merciful, and it's not good. So the judgment of God, the destruction of the wicked, and the eternal life given to the righteous is just, it is good, and this is why the people who believe in God and to, who understand his judgment praise him even when the judgment's being poured out on the earth. So we can talk more about this at another time, um, but all of that to say, listen, friends. Um, we do not need to be afraid of the time of trouble or the end times. We just need to turn our eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. We need to pray that prayer that his kingdom will come and his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven through us. We can be the hands and feet of Jesus to others if we will lay down our lives and allow Christ to live in and through us by the power of his Holy Spirit. If we will surrender our lives completely to Christ and ask the Lord to use us, we can be the light to the world. We can be a blessing to others. We can share the love of God, even in the darkest part of Earth's history. And I don't know about you, but that's really exciting to get to be a part of what God is doing, to share the love of God with people on the Earth. So I just want to invite all of you to join me today in praising the Lord God Almighty. He loves me. He loves you. He's on the throne. And I'm excited to be a part of his kingdom come and his will be done between now and the time we see him at the second coming. So let's make a decision to be a part of that 144,000. Let's make a decision to be a part of that multitude of people that nobody can number, that God's going to harvest from the earth to be a part of his kingdom forever. And let's make the decision to pray that between now and the time of the close of probation, that we will let God use us to reach people for Jesus so that heaven will have more people in it. God's greatest goal is that we will go to the highways and byways and invite people to come into the banquet, to come to the wedding feast. He wants all of us to be a bride to him, a bride to Christ. He wants to redeem all of us from the face of the earth. Christ gave his life so that he could make us adopted sons and daughters of God so that we can be a part of the family of God and that we can be a part of his everlasting kingdom. So say yes to God, say yes to his love. His judgment is good. His steadfast love endures forever. He is holy. He is worthy. He does belong on the throne. And he wants to take all of us home to be with him. And he, everyone who chooses 
to place their faith, faith in him, to repent of their sin. He is faithful and just to forgive. He wants to give you his robes of righteousness. He wants to bring you to heaven. Friends, God is love. And I am excited to tell the world about him until I am no longer on the face of the earth. I hope I get to see Jesus come again, but even if I don't, God is good. I'm going to live for him until the wheels fall off, until God puts me in my grave. I'm going to keep telling people about how good he is. And I hope to see each and every single one of you in heaven. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for our Bible in a Year reading challenge for day 357, 358. We are getting ever closer to the finish line, and we want to praise you for putting a hunger in our hearts for your word. We are so grateful to have had this opportunity to pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our life and to be filled with your word of life, your ancient words ever true, changing me and changing everyone who reads them from death into eternal life. And we we love you, Lord. Thank you for being so good to us, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, everybody, God bless. Have a wonderful night. Thank you, all eight of you who hung out with me late at night doing the Bible in a Year reading challenge. We got Marco, Sarah, Ioni, Deb, Ketley, Mario, Jenny, and Lisa. God bless all of you, and have a wonderful night.